Thank you very much. When the little boy said the emperor was naked, he wasn't telling anyone anything that they didn't already know. They could see the emperor was naked with their own eyeballs. But he was changing the state of their knowledge nonetheless, because at that point, everyone knew that everyone else knew that everyone else knew that everyone else knew the emperor was naked. And that changed their relationship with the emperor, allowing them to challenge him with their laughter. The Emperor's New Clothes refer, is a story about the distinction between shared knowledge and common knowledge. In shared knowledge, A knows X and B knows X. In common knowledge, A knows X and B knows X, and A knows that B knows X, and B knows that A knows X, and A knows that B knows that A knows X ad infinitum. Now, common, the importance of common knowledge is common knowledge in just about every field other than psychology. For example, logicians have long known that facts about the world can be inferred from states of knowledge of individuals. Uh, as in a, a story that appeared in the New York Times about a year ago about a math problem from Singapore that went viral, when is Cheryl's birthday? If, you, uh, if there are a number of facts uh, that are known both by uh, Albert and Bernard about Cheryl's birthday, and then if Albert knows when Cheryl's birthday is, but uh, knows that Bernard does not know, then Bernard knows when Cheryl's birthday, did not know, now knows. Now Albert knows what Cheryl's birthday is. From that information, you can deduce what Cheryl's birthday is, one of many problems in which patterns of shared and common knowledge can lead to inferences about the state of the world. Common knowledge has long been appreciated in game theory, going back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's parable of the stag hunt. Imagine that Alphonse and Gaston are two hunters that live on opposite sides, ends of the woods, and cannot communicate. Every morning, each one faces the choice between going out hunting for rabbit, a uh, small reward that they are virtually guaranteed to bag, or to hunt together and try to fell a stag a large reward which neither of them can fell individually. Well, it's not enough for Alphonse to know that stag are running that day for him to show up uh, prepared to hunt stag, because he has to also know that Gaston knows it. But it's not even enough for him to know that Gaston knows that stag are running, because he has, also has to know that Gaston knows that he knows. Otherwise, Gaston would not show up to hunt stag, worried that Albert would, uh, Alphonse would show up to hunt rabbit uh, ad infinitum. Only common knowledge makes it rational for the two of them to coordinate their behavior. Common knowledge has long been appreciated in political science uh, in understanding protest movements. Why do uh, dictators, uh, why are they terrified at the thought of a mass demonstration, and why is freedom of assembly enshrined as a fundamental right in a democracy? Well, if people are uh, unhappy with their government, uh, every person individually might be disgruntled, but no individual might, would be, may be emboldened to stand up in protest out of the fear that the government will uh, imprison him or, sh or shoot him down. Even if everyone is disgruntled, as long as everyone individual thinks that he might be the only one, they would not have the assurance that they can uh, protest and enjoy safety in numbers. On the other hand, if everyone shows up in a public square, then everyone can see that everyone else can see that everyone else can see that they're dissatisfied with the government. Or if they share their discontent on uh, Facebook or Twitter, then a uh, mass movement can materialize and emboldened with their common knowledge can send a dictator packing. Economists have long been familiar with the concept of uh, common knowledge, for example, in the phenomenon of generating network externalities. In 1984, when Apple introduced the new Macintosh computer, it was not enough to persuade people that it was a superior computer to a PC, because they had to worry that every individual, even if he was or she was convinced that the Macintosh was a great computer, might be afraid to invest in it out of fear that there might not be enough software and peripherals and so on. Uh, people had to know that, it, that uh, other people were buying it at the same time. So Apple then invested in the most expensive commercial in the history of television, 
directed by Ridley Scott and shown during the Super Bowl, an occasion in which everyone knew that everyone else was watching the Super Bowl, in order to generate the network externality of uh, every, uh, sufficient people using the Macintosh for them to be confident that uh, they would enjoy the mutual benefits. But uh, despite its importance in other fields, cognitive uh, common knowledge has been a relatively neglected topic within the field you might expect it to have the most relevance to, uh, namely psychology. And my uh, friend and former colleague, Herb Clark, is in the audience. And Herb is a notable exception for having pointed out the importance of common knowledge or common ground uh, many decades ago. But, uh, but he has been something of a voice in the wilderness. I'm going to try to convince you today that common knowledge is a crucial but largely neglected concept in social psychology. And it comes down to the basic question of why are we social in the first place? What do we get out of hanging out with other people? Well, evolutionary biologists point out that there are two fundamentally different kinds of social cooperation. There's altruistic cooperation, which has received the lion's share of attention, in which one agent benefits someone else at a cost to himself, raising the uh, paradox of how altruistic cooperation could have evolved, because it faces the inherent problem of protecting oneself against exploitation. There is a by now familiar solution, namely reciprocity or uh, tit for tat. And a great deal of research has suggested that we have evolved adaptations to the problem of policing reciprocity, including a sense of fairness and moral emotions such as sympathy, gratitude, anger, uh, guilt, trust, and so on. However, there is another form a, of cooperation, mutualistic cooperation, in which you benefit another person and benefit yourself simultaneously, and that has gotten less attention. The inherent problem in mutualistic cooperation is not uh, motivational, but rather epistemic, namely establishing coordination. Take, for example, uh, two friends. Let's say Herb and I both want to get together for coffee. And uh, we are indifferent as to whether we meet at Pete's uh, or Starbucks. And let's say my cell phone goes dead. I might dimly recall that uh, Herb has a slight preference for uh, Pete's and be tempted to show up there. Then I think, well, Herb recalls that I have a slight preference for Starbucks, so he might, being the nice guy that he is, show up at Starbucks. Well, he might know that I recall that he prefers Pete's, so he might show up at Pete's. Then he might worry that I may not know that he recalls that I have a slight preference for Starbucks, uh, and so on. The solution is uh, common knowledge. And the hypothesis that I'm going to explore is that because coordination problems have been so common in our, uh, in our individual lives and in our evolutionary history, that we have psychological adaptations to common knowledge. Now, crucially, uh, for people to have common knowledge, they need not literally represent an infinite number of nested propositions of I know that he, she knows that I know that she knows, and so on. You quickly get a headache when you try to uh, think through those implications. Uh, common knowledge, though, uh, as with other forms of uh, infinitely nested uh, propositions can be captured in a single recursive formula, where y is common knowledge if everyone knows x and everyone knows y. Uh, more plausibly, common knowledge could consist of a simple mental state, namely the intuition that something is public or out there. And crucially, common knowledge can be ascertained perceptually. In a situation in which there is more than one perceiver, there is a salient event, Everyone can see the event, and everyone can see everyone else seeing the event. That is sufficient to generate common knowledge. I'm going to walk through three psychological phenomena that depend on common knowledge. There's a fourth that I've worked on that uh, I won't have time to discuss, and that is bystander intervention, uh, unless we have time at, uh, at the end. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators in these experiments, James Lee, University of Minnesota, Kyle Thomas with the uh, firm TipTap, Peter DeSholey at uh, SUNY Stony Brook, and Omar Hake at Brown Medical School. Uh, I'll start with the uh, uh, implementation of Rousseau's parable of the stag hunt, namely how people um, negotiate coordination dilemmas. The question is, are people sensitive to the need for common knowledge in deciding whether to engage in risky coordination? Uh, so here is the scenario that we presented our subjects with. You are a baker. 
You can make dinner rolls for a small profit or hot dog buns for a larger profit, but only if the butcher is making hot dog sausages that day, and whether he does or not depends on the daily price. So here's the payoff matrix. Remember, you're the baker. Well, half the subjects were the butcher. You can make either hot dog buns or dinner rolls. The butcher can make either hot dogs, the meat, or chicken wings. And the payoffs are that depending on the day, uh, it, you can uh, make either uh, $2, a large profit, uh, but if the price is low that day, it may only be 50 cents. Uh, if you make hot dog buns while the butcher makes chicken wings, the uh, buns without the meat are useless, so you make nothing. If you make uh, dinner rolls, then you get a dollar profit regardless of what the butcher does. And we varied the levels of embedding of knowledge. In a private knowledge condition, we tell people that a messenger has told you, but not the butcher, today's hot dog price. In the first shared knowledge condition, what we call secondary knowledge, a messenger has told the butcher the price, and the messenger has also told you the price. So you know that he knows, but he doesn't know that you know. In a tertiary shared knowledge condition, we tell people that a messenger told the butcher the price and told the butcher that he would tell you the price, but he did not tell the butcher that he would tell you that he had told him. That is, he knows that you know the price, he doesn't know that you know that he knows. And in a common knowledge condition, the price is conveyed by a loudspeaker, so you know that he knows that you know that he knows, and so on. What leads people to decide whether or not to take a chance at a large profit if the, uh, their counterpart does the same? Well, in the uh, private knowledge condition, uh, only 10% of people uh, coordinated. Uh, in secondary and tertiary knowledge, somewhat less than half of the people decided to coordinate, a significant difference from private knowledge. Uh, with common knowledge, uh, almost 90% of the participants decided to uh, coordinate uh, a significant difference from uh, private and secondary. Uh, we also debriefed people afterwards and probed whether they understood the uh, differences among the conditions. Um, not, or, or which condition they were in because it was between subjects, not only so that we could um, eliminate subjects who uh, did not understand the conditions, but also so that we could probe what condition people tended to confuse with what, with what other condition. That is using the technique of confusion matrices long used in perception and uh, cognition to tap people's mental representations. What we found is that virtually, if um, these are the conditions that, that uh, people actually were in. This was the error uh, that, that they reported off the diagonals. Virtually all of the errors consisted of confusing uh, one kind of shared knowledge, tertiary, with another kind of shared knowledge, secondary. Um, that is, private shared and common knowledge were rarely confused with each other. Tertiary shared knowledge was often confused with secondary shared knowledge. And it suggests that private shared and common knowledge are uh, distinct cognitive categories. Uh, a second set of phenomena that, uh, that I have explored, and in fact, the very phenomenon that uh, got me uh, uh, interested in common knowledge, is the uh, <coughs> phenomenon at the intersection of psycholinguistics and social psychology that I think of as innuendo and euphemism. That is, why don't people just say what they mean? Why do we beat around the bush and shilly-shally and uh, have people catch our drift or read between the lines instead of just blurting out what we mean. Let me give you an example. This is a fictional uh, example from the movie Fargo. Uh, you may recall that in an opening scene, a kidnapper has a hostage tied up in the back seat of his car. Inconveniently, he's pulled over by the police because the car is missing its plates. The uh, policeman asks the uh, kidnapper to show him his license. He proffers his wallet with a license showing and a $50 bill extending ever so slightly, and he says to the officer, I was thinking that maybe the best thing would be to take care of it here in Brainerd, a uh, proposition that the audience and presumably the uh, officer understand as a veiled bribe. The New Yorker illustrated a similar situation in which a driver winks at the officer and says, what Hershey bar? I don't see any Hershey bar. Now, this is uh, an example of what linguists sometimes call indirect speech. Uh, and uh, this is something that we do all the time. For example, if you could pass the guacamole, that would be awesome. 
Now, taken literally, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But we all interpret it as a polite request. Uh, anyone who has sat through a fundraising dinner is familiar with euphemistic snoring, such as, we're counting on you to show leadership in our campaign for the future. Uh, to wit, give money. Would you like to come up and see my etchings? Uh, this has been understood as a sexual come on for so long that in 1934, James Thurber drew a cartoon in which a man says to his date, you wait here and I'll bring the etchings down. And then fans of The Sopranos might remember an episode in which uh, a member of the family goes up to someone in a bar and says, I hear you're the jury foreman in the Soprano trial. It's an important civic responsibility. You've got a wife and kids. I know you'll do the right thing. That is a veiled bribe, a uh, thre veiled threat. So here is the psychological puzzle. Why are bribes, requests, seductions, solicitations, and threats so often veiled when presumably both parties know what they mean? And uh, Martin Novak, James Lee, and I have uh, proposed what we call the theory of the strategic speaker uh, to preview that indirect speech is a rational strategy to attain plausible deniability of common knowledge of relational model, relationship models. Let me step you through each of those. So let me start with plausible deniability. Uh, this begins with what game theorists some, like Thomas Schelling call the identification problem. Namely, how do you figure out the rational course of action when the outcome depends on another intelligent agent, but you don't know the, intelligent, the agent's values? And bribing a police officer is a, uh, a clear-cut case. So imagine that you are a uh, driver and you had uh, two options to uh, tender a bribe in so many words or to remain silent. What is the uh, optimal strategy? Well, the answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on whether you're facing a dishonest officer who would uh, accept the bribe and uh, set you free, a high payoff. On the other hand, you might be facing an honest officer who would not only rebuff the bribe, but might arrest you for bribery of very high cost. On the other hand, if you uh, remain silent, you would get the moderate cost of a traffic ticket in either case. Uh, and in deciding whether to take the, a chance at a high payoff and a high penalty, or a guaranteed moderate cost, it's not clear what the optimal strategy is. But now let's imagine you had a third option, a uh, veiled bribe, as in, uh, I was wondering if we could take care of it here in Brainerd. Well, now a dishonest officer could sniff out the bribe uh, and uh, accept the payment, giving you the high payoff of going free. An honest officer couldn't make a bribery charge stick in, in court by the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The worst thing that he could give you is a traffic ticket. So the veiled bribe combines the very high payoff of bribing a dishonest officer with a relatively small cost of failing to bribe an honest officer in a single option, and that makes it the optimal uh, choice. Uh, this is the logic of plausible deniability, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. Now things start to get a bit more interesting. Namely, why do people use indirect speech in non-legal situations where there are no financial or legal payoffs or penalties? For example, in bribery in everyday life. Now, you might say, bribery in everyday life? When would I, an honest, upstanding uh, citizen, ever be tempted to offer a bribe in everyday life? Well, how's this? You want to go to the hottest restaurant in town. You have no reservation. Why not slip the maitre d' a $20 bill in exchange for jumping the queue and being seated immediately? This is the assignment that uh, an editor at Gourmet Magazine gave the journalist Bruce Feiler, who dared him to try it uh, uh, in some of Manhattan's chicest restaurants on a Saturday night and write up his experiences for the magazine. And uh, I found this report utterly fascinating. For one thing, uh, although as far as I know, no one has ever gone to jail for the crime of attempting to bribe a maitre d', the assignment filled him with anxiety, and here's how he started the article. I am nervous, truly nervous. As the taxi bounces through the trendier neighborhoods of Manhattan, I keep imagining the possible retorts of some incensed maitre d'. What kind of establishment do you think this is? How dare you insult me? Do you think you can get in with that? Second, uh, when he did screw up the courage to offer the bribe, he instinctively used indirect speech. 
he held a $20 bill out of the line of sight of the, uh, uh, himself and the maitre d', and he used a line such as, such as, I hope you can fit us in, or can you speed up my weight, or I was wondering if you might have a cancellation. And the third interesting finding was the outcome, which is that it worked every time. As he put it, we were seated in between two and eight minutes to the astonishment of my date. So what's going on? What are the intangible costs that drive people to indirect speech? And here's a theory, that it is, consists of relationship mismatches. That is that human relationships fall into a small number of types. Each has a tacit rule for distributing resources. Each applies by default to certain kinds of dyads, contexts, and resources, but Crucially, each can be extended to other kinds through negotiation. This is a theory that I co-opted from the anthropologist uh, Alan Fisk, whose uh, sister Susan received one of the awards yesterday at the awards ceremony. Uh, according to uh, Alan Fisk, human relations, natural human relationships uh, fall into just three types. There is dominance, whose rule is uh, don't mess with me, and which presumably evolved from the dominance hierarchies that are uh, prevalent throughout the primate order, indeed the mammalian class. There's a very different relationship of uh, communality, uh, whose rule is what's mine is thine, what's thine is mine, communal sharing, and which naturally evolved uh, by the mechanism of kin selection and uh, in situations of mutualism. And that's the natural relationship that we have with uh, our kin, with our spouse, uh, with our close friends. Uh, and then there is reciprocity, the rule, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, which conforms to the logic of reciprocal altruism. Now, behavior that's acceptable when one relationship is uh, in effect can be anomalous in another. Uh, Fisk points out, for example, that you could, uh, at the uh, cocktail party, you could go over to your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife and help yourself to a shrimp off their plate. But you wouldn't go up to the president of the Association for Psychological Science, for example, and help yourself to a shrimp off her plate. Uh, because what you can get away with in a relationship of communality, you can't get away with in a relationship of dominance. Uh, another example, if you're invited over to a dinner party, uh, it would be rather gauche if at the end of the meal you pulled out your wallet and offered to uh, pay the host for the cost of the food. Uh, and again, that's because in, uh, close friends follow the uh, relationship of communality in which the uh, underlying assumption is that people give and take uh, freely. Uh, in contrast, if you were at a restaurant, you would not go up to the owner and say, well, we really enjoyed ourselves this evening. Uh, at some point, we'll have you back uh, because their uh, reciprocity uh, uh, reigns. Now, when those are cases where the relationship in force is clear cut, everyone knows what to do, but when relationships are ambiguous, a divergent understanding can lead to, uh, can be costly, which we experience as the emotion of awkwardness. For example, there can be awkward moments in a workplace or in a university where a uh, student or an employee doesn't know whether he can refer to his uh, supervisor on a first name basis or invite him out uh, uh, after work for a beer where you have the uh, um, tension between dominance or friendship. It's well known that good friends should not engage in a uh, significant business transaction, such as one of them selling his car to the other, uh, because uh, as we know, the very act of negotiating a price can, as we say, put a strain on the friendship. That is the conflict between a communality relationship which holds among close friends and the reciprocity relationship that holds among business partners. The clash between dominance and sex defines the battleground of sexual harassment as when a supervisor solicits sex from a, a supervisee or employee or student. And even the two different kinds of communal relationships of friendship or uh, sexual relationship give rise to the tensions of dating. This gives rise to a social identification problem, a kind of miscoordination problem where the Social costs of awkwardness from a mismatched relationship type can duplicate the payoff matrix of a legal identification uh, problem, even if there are no tangible fines or punishments. And bribing a maitre d' is a perfect example where the mismatch is between the authority relationship that ordinarily 
pertains to a restaurant where the maitre d' is the, uh, the master of his thief. He seats people where uh, he, and when he wants versus the reciprocity relationship that is brought up by the bribe under which the maitre d' would be obligated to uh, seat the customer in exchange for accepting the bribe. So once again, if the only options are to bribe or not bribe, then the outcome depends on what kind of maitre d' uh, you're facing. A uh, corrupt maitre d' could uh, accept the bribe, you get the reward of a quick table, and consummate a relationship of reciprocity. Both sides understand the relationship in the same way. On the other hand, if you have a scrupulous maitre d' who would say, uh, what kind of establishment do you think this is? How dare you insult me? Do you think you can get in with that? That is insisting on dominance while you're offering reciprocity. The resulting miscoordination gives rise to the unpleasant uh, emotion of awkwardness. I am nervous, truly nervous. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't bribe, then you accept the dominance relationship between the maitre d' and the customer, and you have the moderate cost of a long wait in either case. Uh, However, if there is a third option of, uh, I was wondering if you might have a cancellation, well then a corrupt maitre d' can sniff out the bribe and uh, consummate a reciprocity relationship, show you to a quick table. A scrupulous maitre d' could uh, simply decide to uh, let it pass, let it slide, maintain the dominance relationship. The worst thing that you would have is the long wait. You get the high payoff of bribing a corrupt maitre d' combined with the um, small cost of failing to bribe a scrupulous maitre d' combined in the same option, making the ambiguous or veiled bribe the tempting choice. There's one remaining problem, uh, which is uh, no one is fooled by this charade. Why do people resort to indirect speech even when an innuendo is so obvious that both parties know its intent? So the, the deniability is really not all that plausible. Why should a transparent innuendo still feel less awkward than an overture that is on the record? Uh, this is a situation that uh, figured into one of the uh, amusing scenes from the romantic comedy When Harry Met Sally. Romantic comedies are often about the tension between uh, uh, a friendship and a, and a sexual or romantic relationship. In an early scene in the film, Harry and Sally have just met. Uh, Harry ha makes a comment that Sally interprets as sexual, and she confronts him. You're coming on to me. And he, Harry says, what do you want me to do about it? I take it back, okay? I take it back. She says, you can't take it back. She says, why not? She said, because it's already out there. He says, oh, geez, what are we supposed to do? Call the cops? It's already out there. So the psychological puzzle is, what is the status of an overture that is out there or on the record that makes it so much worse than a veiled overture that is implicated indirectly. The hypothesis is that indirect speech merely provides shared knowledge, whereas direct speech provides common knowledge, and that relationships, a kind of coordination game, are maintained or nullified by common knowledge of the relationship type. Which is to say, if, uh, imagine that Harry says, would you like to come up and see my etchings, and Sally turns him down. Well, Sally knows that she's turned down a sexual overture. And Harry knows that Sally has turned down a sexual overture. But does Sally know that Harry knows? She could still be thinking, well, maybe Harry thinks I'm naive. And does Harry know that Sally knows that he knows? Harry could be thinking, well, maybe Sally thinks I'm dense. So there's no common knowledge, and they can maintain the fiction of a friendship. But now imagine that Harry said, would you like to come up and have sex? Well, now Harry knows that Sally knows that Harry knows that Sally knows. They cannot maintain the fiction of a friendship. And that, I suggest, is what's behind the intuition that with direct speech, blurting something out, you can't take it back. It's out there. So here's an empirical test that James Lee and I did. We had people uh, take part in uh, read fictional scenarios where a speaker utters a proposition varying in level of directness. The subject puts himself or herself in the speaker's shoes or the hearer's shoes and rates the likelihood of various interpretations that the character might make uh, in that scenario. So we had a bribe scenario where uh, Kyle is pulled over for speeding. He hands over his wallet with a license and a $50 bill protruding. And he says one of the following uh, four things. Uh, I'm very sorry, officer. I've really learned my lesson. From now on, you can be sure that I'll be more careful. Uh, the, only the very slightest uh, scintilla of a hint of a bribe. A little bit more direct. I'm very sorry, officer. I know that I was speeding and that I'll have to pay for my mistake. 
Uh, third, I'm very sorry, officer, but I'm actually in the middle of something right now, sort of an emergency, so maybe the best thing would be to take care of this here without going to court or doing any paperwork. Uh, still more overt, or a uh, naked bribe. I'm very sorry, officer, if I give you a 50, will you just let me go? Uh, we had a seduction scenario. Michael and Lisa are co-workers and good friends. After dinner, Michael drives Lisa home. When passing his apartment, he says, one of four options, either, wow, I feel like we've been talking uh, so much, but it's only 10.30. Slightly more uh, risque. My friend just emailed me these pictures from our trip to Europe and I was, uh, that I was telling you about. Do you want to come over and have a look? A little bit uh, more suggestive. You know, I have a really terrific view from my balcony. You can see the whole city, the lights, the ocean. Would you like to come over and have a look? Or the naked, uh, come on, I find you really attractive, and I enjoyed being with you tonight a lot. Would you like to come over and have sex? Uh, we also had a threat scenario. I won't go through the details where there is a, a various degrees of veiling of a threat where a professor threatens a student with the loss of a fellowship unless she agrees to work in his lab for the summer. So the prediction is that in, uh, indir indirect speech may generate a confident interpretation in the hearer, but the confidence falls with each level of embedding about a belie of beliefs about beliefs. Whereas direct speech generates common knowledge, the degree of confidence at, is high at all levels of embedding. Well, it's a challenge to test common knowledge because it's hard to uh, even understand the various degrees of uh, embedded beliefs about beliefs about beliefs. So we try to walk our subjects through it uh, one step at a, at a time. Uh, in probing not, uh, interpretation on the part of the hearer, first order beliefs, we had, we, I told people, put yourself in Lisa's position. What is she thinking at this point? And we had uh, seven uh, statements raise, varying in degree of Lisa's confidence, ranging from I'm absolutely certain that Michael was not asking me to have sex, uh, I'm virtually certain, and so on, all the way to I'm virtually certain that he was asking me, and I'm absolutely certain that he was asking me, and we assigned them numbers uh, one to seven. Second order, speaker's belief about what the, how the hearer interpreted it. Lisa has politely said that she wants to go home. Now put yourself in Michael's position. What is he thinking? And we gave them uh, alternatives ranging from, I'm absolutely certain that Lisa didn't understand that I was asking her for sex, uh, to I'm absolutely certain that she did understand. Second order, hearer belief. How the hearer interprets the speaker's belief about the hearer's interpretation. Lisa knows that Michael was asking her to have sex. Put yourself in her position. What is she thinking now? Michael thinks that I didn't understand he was asking me to have sex. I'm absolutely certain to, to that. Statements varying uh, up to Michael knows that I understood that he was asking me to have sex. I'm absolutely certain of that. So we use the first person. We vary the choice of verb, uh, both of which make uh, statements about embedded belief states easier to entertain. Uh, third order speaker, suppose that Michael does realize that Lisa knowingly turned down his invitation to have sex. Put yourself in Michael's position. What is he thinking? Lisa thinks that I didn't understand that she turned me down for sex. I'm absolutely certain of that. All the way down to Lisa knows that I understood that she turned me down for sex. I'm absolutely certain of that. Finally, we pushed our luck and we probed the third order hearer's state of belief. Suppose that Lisa is certain that Michael knows she turned down his invitation to have sex. Put yourself in Lisa's position. What is she thinking? Michael understands that I turned him down for sex, but he doesn't realize that I know he understands that to uh, he does realize that I know he understands that. So here are the uh, results. On the uh, x-axis, we have degree of embedding of belief from what the, uh, how the hearer interprets it to how the speaker guesses the Hearer interprets it, speakers guess about the, uh, sorry, hearers guess about the speakers guess about the hearers interpretation and so on. The parameter is the degree of explicitness from very vague to overt. You can see that for all the forms of speech that are suggestive or innuendos, uh, the degree of confidence falls with the level of embedding of uh, he thinks that she thinks that he thinks that she thinks. With overt speech, people are equally confident uh, no matter how many levels of embedding you go. So to sum up the, this uh, part of the talk, the analysis of innuendo and euphemism, uh, innuendo merely provides shared knowledge, direct speech provides common knowledge, Social relationships, a kind of coordination game, are ratified by common knowledge of the relationship type. 
innuendos by preventing common knowledge allow a proposition uh, to be tendered without ipso facto changing the relationship type by the very act of offering the proposition. Uh, the third phenomenon that I will um, uh, talk about this morning is the phenomenon of self-conscious emotions, which I briefly alluded to in the uh, discussion of uh, indirect speech. Uh, when we commit a social infraction, a faux pas, in front of onlookers, uh, why do we experience unpleasant self-conscious emotions such as embarrassment, guilt, and shame? And I will, they are separate, but I, for the purpose of this talk, I'll treat them interchangeably. Uh, why do we avert our gaze? Why do we not want to show our face? Why do we uh, cringe? Why do we blush? Well, here's a hypothesis. That self-conscious emotions have the function of safeguarding relationships by preventing what we call a defection trap. So social relationships are coordination games. That is, two people can benefit if they tacitly agree on mutual provision of kindness or respect or support or indifference or affection or malice, as long as both parties um, uh, agree that that's the relationship in force. Now, uh, common knowledge of a breach of mutual expectation, that is, a faux pas, can unravel the relationship as each one worries that the other one might interpret the faux pas as a defection, and therefore preemptively uh, defect, in which case it would be rational for you to defect. The other party worrying about that might preemptively, preemptively defect, and so on, what we call a defection trap. What self-conscious emotions do, the, the blushing, the embarrassment, and so on, is they motivate the transgressor to acknowledge the violation, to show that he has the same expectations. That is, uh, he may have uh, messed up, he may have violated a rule, but he knows what the rules are. That is, he might be a bumbler, but he is not a psychopath or a loose cannon or an oddball. Signal that it won't be repeated in the form of uh, credible apologies, and that this should particularly be true when the violation is common knowledge. We ran two experiments. We had uh, participants imagine being caught in an embarrassing situation. Uh, they made fun of a mutual friend's speech impediment where the uh, friend shows up and catches them. They uh, pilfer petty cash to compensate for a lost repeat, receipt. They couldn't get reimbursed, so they rectify the situation by stealing from uh, petty cash. Or they uh, pass gas in a lecture with various degrees of uh, audibility. And uh, we vary the level of knowledge. Uh, in private knowledge, no one noticed. Or someone noticed, but you don't know that someone noticed, which really should be the same as, as uh, no one noticing at all, as far as you're concerned. We had two conditions of shared knowledge. Someone noticed, you know that they noticed, but they don't know that you know. Or one level higher, someone noticed, and they also know that you saw them notice. Finally, common knowledge, uh, you make uh, eye contact, a very effective common knowledge generator, and uh, which is utterly uh, incriminating. Uh, we had people rate the degree to which they uh, would imagine themselves feeling self-conscious emotions like uh, uh, guilt, embarrassment, shame, also the degree to which they thought they might show it in bodily postures such as uh, cringing or uh, blushing. I'll just show the rated emotion. Um, and with uh, private knowledge, um, there's a moderate degree of embarrassment, with shared knowledge considerably more, and with common knowledge, the highest degree of rated embarrassment of all. The physical reactions parallel to the reported degrees of uh, uh, experienced emotion. Now, uh, it is dodgy when you simply ask people to imagine themselves in a situation and to report what they think they might feel in that situation. So we wanted to come up with a case in which we actually put them in a compromising situation. We used a paradigm that is, has become fairly common in research on self-conscious emotions. Uh, that is, we had them um, sing out loud, which is a, a pretty reliable way to make someone feel embarrassed. Specifically, we had them perform a karaoke song before a panel of judges who they <laughs> thought were uh, fellow students. Uh, the uh, Adele song, Rolling in the Deep, which has a nice soaring chorus by which people could uh, embarrass themselves. Uh, in a shared knowledge condition, the, um, we told them that the judges think that it's a, a one-way video feed. That is, uh, they don't know that you can actually see them. They can see you. They think you can't see them. 
In the common knowledge condition, we said they know that it's a two-way video feed, so as they are watching you perform, they know that you are seeing them judge you. Now, these uh, people weren't actually present. It was just a, a videotape, but the, uh, uh, most of the subjects believed that these really were uh, fellow students. And not surprisingly, we found that uh, in mere shared knowledge, um, there was a, a significant degree of embarrassment, but there was uh, far more when the uh, witness act was uh, common knowledge. So some uh, final thoughts on common knowledge. If common knowledge is so fundamental to social life, why haven't we noticed it before? Why hasn't it got the, gotten the kind of attention that we've given to uh, cheater detection and a sense of fairness and uh, emotions like uh, trust and anger and so on? And I suggest that we actually have. Uh, we don't use the language of common knowledge to describe it, but it actually is quite uh, ubiquitous in social life, um, such as in uh, the dynamics of hypocrisy, of taboo, of tact, uh, of political correctness, of so-called red lines, uh, market bubbles, where you have false common knowledge, where uh, everyone thinks that everyone else thinks that an asset is uh, increasing, and so it does increase up to a point. In mock outrage, as in I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is taking place in this establishment. In the phenomenon of Kardashian celebrity, where someone is famous for being famous, and in the Washington gaffe, defined as uh, when a politician says something that is true. <laughs> um, I also think that we have, uh, <clears throat> we refer to common knowledge using a Lakoffian uh, conceptual metaphor that is a family of related uh, linguistic tropes that are all organized around a central image. In particular, that common knowledge is a conspicuous object or sound, as in, it's out there. The cat is out of the bag. It was in your face. The bell can't be unrung. Of course, the emperor's new clothes. The elephant in the room, something that everyone can not help but notice, but they pretend not to notice. And one more that should be uh, familiar to those of you who are fans of the uh, Seinfeld sitcom, which I will show you now. Anyway, uh thinking of making a big move. What? I might tell her that I love her. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I, uh, I came this close last night, but I just did just, just chicken back. Well, that's a big move, Georgie boy. Are you confident in the I love you return? 50-50. Because if you don't get that return, that's a pretty big matzo ball hanging out there. <laughs> Yes, that's a pretty big matzo ball hanging out there. Uh, <clears throat> so in sum, I'd like to suggest that while people may have difficulty literally entertaining the state of knowledge of I know that she knows that I know that she knows that I know that she knows and so on, everyone has a perfectly intuitive understanding of the emperor, the elephant, and the matzo ball. Thank you very much.